chew on this. Hello everyone and welcome to the Beer to Geeks, the weekly grab bag of topics covering movies, comics, video games and TV. My name is Jags and I am the Beard Master. Hey going everyone, solo show again this week, I mentioned at the end of last week's show that Bob may or may not be here depending on his super secret new project he's working on. Uh, unfortunately he's not here this week. I did mention that I might skip this week's episode if he wasn't going to be able to turn up. But, you know, I thought that might give me a chance to, uh, you know, start working on this workshop, you know, for the freelance festival and stuff, start working on that. But then, you know, I've, I've watched a movie recently, um, you know, there's been a bit of good news, so I thought, ah, bagger it, we'll, we'll get another show out this week. So, enjoy this bite-sized morsel of the Beard of Geeks podcast for this week. So, first of all, I gotta say, my back is fucking killing me. I don't know what I've done. Uh, on the weekend, just gone... Uh, my girlfriend's dad, it was her, uh, his birthday, beg your pardon, sorry Greg, uh, it was his birthday and he decided he wanted to go up to sort of one of the coastal areas that's about sort of 45 minutes to an hour away for lunch. So we jumped in the car and we drove up there and I pulled up in the car park and I got out of the car and my lower back was just like bloody killing me. I was like, what have I done? So Ever since then, that was about three or four days ago. My back's been killing me every day. I've been still been going to work though, but I got home from work and I was like an old man. I was getting around like a half shut pocket knife and couldn't stand up straight. So then I ended up, you know, I was like an old geezer laying down on the couch. I had a hot water bottle underneath my lower back and that actually helped. I was there for about three hours, but that helped quite a bit. But yeah, every day it's just because I work a very physical job, you see, so. Every day, it's just sort of taking its toll on my back a little bit more. It's not too bad at the moment. It was giving me strife this morning, but I think uh, I'm coming right. You got no bloody idea what I did. Guess I'm just getting old. It'll actually be my birthday next. Uh, Bob had his last week. Happy birthday again, Bob. It's mine next, and then it's Pat's in October. We're all getting pretty old. Anyway, as we were talking about last week, I want to go back to the Cloverfield Paradox, because... Cloverfield news just seems to keep on coming at the moment. Uh, last week, I didn't mention this. I had this written down on my bit of pad, as I do every week, but I always skip over something. But lucky for following week's episode, I always bring it up. There was a cool uh, thing a Reddit user found. I don't have their username or whatever, because Reddit sucks. Pat, you're welcome. They actually found that if you play the Cloverfield Paradox and Cloverfield together at the same time, when Paradox gets to, I think it's like the 18 minute, 20 second mark, they activate the accelerator and then it runs for a few seconds and then it like shits itself and shit gets real, as we like to say. In the same point in the first movie, when everyone's sort of at the party in the apartment building, and then that's where you hear the explosion and all the lights and that go out in the city. So they timed it bloody well. So these two events coexist sort of next to each other they sync up which i just thought was you know whatever you might think of those movies in that franchise that was a really cool idea so i'll take my hat off to them my brand new hat i bought on the weekend i'll take it off to you and also while we're still on the cloverfield subject uh we had a news report from the hollywood reporter during the week just after the super bowl just after cloverfield paradox aired did i say cloverfield experiment just before i might have it's paradox. I keep getting that mixed up. I wrote it on my bit of paper last week, actually, the Cloverfield experiment. And then after about five minutes, I looked at it and realized I'm like, hang on a minute. That's not right, you idiot. Change that. Scribble that out. Change it to paradox. Anyway, Hollywood Reporter stated that Netflix actually bought the film from Paramount for just over $50 million. Now, the budget of the movie was $45 million, And from what I've read as well... Uh, they had some reshoots and that for the movie, but the budget started to balloon a little bit. So probably getting up to around the $50 million area. J.J. Abrams has reported that, well, he said in the interview on that, like, on the Netflix release, he said that, oh, we thought it'd be a great idea, like, keeping in with the, the sort of mysterious marketing and that for the Cloverfield franchise, the previous films, like, this would be a great idea to, like, air it on the Super Bowl, and then straight after it would debut on Netflix. Yeah, that's the story from JJ, but apparently the the actual, the marketing stunt, it was uh, a rescue plan that was sort of hatched by JJ Abrams, uh, the CEO of Paramount, Netflix chief, and another person, head of original film, Scott Stuber. 
Stuba? Stubber. Stuba. Apparently, the film was in trouble during its production, and they were really worried that the movie would perish at the box office when it hit. So, they came up with a plan, and they got in touch with Netflix, and this is becoming a bit of a trend now, I've noticed, that it was a win-win situation for everyone, because Netflix would buy this movie for just over $50 million. Paramount makes their money back without having to spend another 30 40 50 million dollars marketing the film and then it's not going to make any money anyway so they've got their money back netflix has got a new movie and all they had to do was whip up a trailer pay for it to be on the super bowl which netflix isn't afraid of doing because they like to lash out cash wherever they can to like build their library and it got netflix attention so whether or not the movie was success or not like critically You can't deny that the marketing and the attention that Netflix would have gotten in that sort of 24-hour to three, four, five, six-day period or however long after. I mean, we're still talking about it. It's been over a week and we're still talking about it. So it was a win-win for everyone. Like, Netflix didn't have to pay to produce the film. They just bought the completed film. And so they've saved money in that regard. Paramount's got their money back. They haven't suffered the embarrassment of it being a box office failure and then worrying about the next Cloverfield film. But apparently that movie's still going to cinemas and that as well, so we're getting out later this year. And people are suspecting that another J.J. Abrams-produced film that stars Daisy Ridley, I think it's called Colum or Kalima, starts with a K, that's the next Cloverfield film. That's the fifth one. So we think of way ahead, but it wouldn't bloody surprise me anyway. So yeah, lots of Cloverfield news lately. You can't get enough Cloverfield at the moment. It's pretty cool. Like I said last week, I do like the franchise. Paradox was definitely the weakest of the three, but I still didn't like hate it. There was a lot of stuff. I was like, eh, I wish you fixed that. And I wish you tried a bit harder there and you didn't have to connect them. But you know, it is what it is. And you know, I'll, I'll still get it and I'll, I'll buy it when it comes out. Paramount retained the distribution rights, so, you know, in three, four, five months, it'll hit Blu-ray and DVD and everything and that, but, you know, Netflix now technically own the rights to the film, they own the film, so it's technically now a Netflix original. Netflix can do whatever they want, they can say whatever they want when they own it, can't they? I wonder how hard it is to get a job at Netflix. Hmm, it's probably difficult. Anyway, let's move on to the news, shall we? So i got a couple of little tidbits of news, a few little morsels for you in this bite-sized episode of the Beauty Geeks podcast. Three new trailers in the last week that I want to shine some light upon. First of all, Deadpool 2. Now, this trailer was really fun. I um, said it a lot last week. It's very on the nose. Uh, as it is, like, uh, you know, the whole half the gimmick of Deadpool is the whole fourth wall breaking, which is great, and it really works for that character. But, you know, the, the trailer starts with Cable and Josh Brolin. He looks amazing. He's given this big uh, voiceover monologue and, you know, I'm a soldier and I'm more machine than man or whatever, and he turns around to show off his big metal arm and he's just got the big green visual effects it's like sleeve on and then deadpool does his voice over and he's like where's the arm effects they're not done it's not like we're removing a mustache or anything like that nice dig there at justice league which i really did enjoy and then deadpool's just like i'll fix it and then it cuts to like a big toy story scene where deadpool's playing with toys and he's got like a toy cable and he's like oh no it's sheriff deadpool and then you know like balls in the face and all this sort of stuff and the toys fall over and they've got wade written on the bottoms of the feet which is really good a nice little toy story touch there and then the visual effects are done and they cut to the actual trailer and it looks great uh we found out that terry cruz is actually in the movie that should be good um more negasonic teenage warhead colossus we've got julian dennison in there dupinder's back Deadpool's costume actually looks quite good, and it looks like they're splashing a bit more cash on this movie. Maybe not as much, but uh, more so than the first film. And Domino's in there as well, and she's got really sweet, like, Uzis with blades on the end, like, on the fronts of them. They look really cool. I just thought that was, like, a little cool, um, yeah, comic book flourish, like, on the guns and that. I thought that was very cool. Very sort of uh, Rob Liefeld in that regard. Yeah, I really enjoyed that bit. So the trailer was cool, it was really fun, 
Um, looking forward to that movie. I wasn't the biggest fan of the first Deadpool. Like, I really liked it. I went to the cinema and I saw it and it was great and I had a good time and it was quite different to every other superhero film that had been out. But it just, it wasn't, it wasn't great. Like, I asked Pat before the movie even came out. I'm like, hey, what's your favorite superhero movie? And he's like, Deadpool. I'm like, that's not, the movie's not even out yet. How can you just, oh, it will be my favorite. Oh, I was like, you idiot. So, Pat thinks that's a five-star movie. That's fine. In his mind, that's a five-star movie, and he loves it, and that's great. But for me, it's probably a three-star. It's a medium. Like, really, you take out the humor and the character, and there really is no plot. It's very sort of paint-by-numbers. The villain's very one-dimensional, and, you know, if it wasn't for Ryan Reynolds and the humor, you know, the fourth wall breaking, if those three things weren't in it, it wouldn't be any good. It's... You know, you take out those few things and that's pretty rubbish. But no, it was great. It was the most successful R-rated movie ever made. Um, I'll definitely go see the second one. Of course I will. As if I wouldn't. Secondly, we had the first teaser trailer for Venom with Tom Hardy. Now, didn't really know what to make of this movie. Like, when it's coming out. Oh, it's a Sony movie. It's separate from the MCU. Spider-Man's not going to be in it. How can you have a Venom movie without Spider-Man? Yada, 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 yada. I still personally think that there's going to be a scene at the end or a little... Something in Infinity War that ties it to Venom. Maybe. Anyway, that's, that's what I'd like to think. Because Tom Holland is apparently going to be in Venom. He's going to have a cameo as Peter Parker... In what capacity, I don't know. It'd just be really nice to see that, you know, the Venom origin and his spider-like abilities, like, he got them from from Spider-Man. Like, the symbiote bonded with Peter, and then it sort of copied all those abilities, and when it, you know, pasted itself onto Eddie Brock, you know, he sort of inherited those abilities. The strength, you know, the the uh the webbing out of the tops of the hands you know the backs of the hands and he's immune to peter's spider sense after that so all those little things that really sort of intrinsically tie him to peter parker and spider-man and that universe that's just something that personally i'd like to see i'd like to see them somehow tie it back to spider-man anyway the actual trailer was (sighs) mediocre i mean it's the absolute definition of a teaser trailer. I mean, yeah, there was some teasing going on, but not really any Venom whatsoever. Closest thing you see to Venom is you see the symbiote in, like, this glass, like, chamber thing, like, scientist dude standing over it. Looks pretty cool. Um, the effects looks pretty good. I know they're probably not totally finished. They'll probably look better when the movie comes out. And you see, like, some of the black veiny symbiote creep up uh tom hardy's neck eddie brock's neck when he's in the um i think he's like in the x-ray machine or whatever like that yeah it it just kind of shows lots of action beats and you get the tom hardy over the shoulder like walk like the little like stunted walk that he does the little shifty walk shoulder wobbling from side to side you know um he really perfected that in warrior by the way but you get like two separate shots of that you get one and then it cuts to another shot of him like the same different clothes like from behind it's it's just kind of funny i just like yep you could tell like if you were 100 meters away and you saw that guy walk and you'd be like that's tom hardy anyway we didn't see much a little bit disappointing would have liked to have seen just a little bit more just a little bit more but you know it is a teaser and we really did get teased didn't we you know, especially a movie like this with, like, so much banking on it and that as well, like, people wondering so much about it, you think they probably would have just showed maybe just a little bit more, even if we just saw a hand, like a, like a symbiote-covered hand or something like that, you know, that would have been enough. But we just got, like, lots of action beats, Tom Hardy in the water, Tom Hardy running, Tom Hardy walking, Tom Hardy on a motorbike, cars crashing, Tom Hardy on a bed, lots of stuff. Tom Hardy doing voiceovers. So that's in October. At least they got the font right. Like the font, they took it straight off the comic covers, the Venom, like font. Yeah, it looks looks really good. Straight back out of the 90s, that is. And our final trailer talk for today. This isn't something particularly mainstream. This is more for the uh, the sort of B-grade listeners. Um, I'm a big fan of Tremors with Kevin Bacon and Fred Ward. 
uh, from 1990. Yeah, you know, in perfection and graboids, and I I really do love that movie. I'm looking forward to the the I think it's the Sci-Fi. Is it the Sci-Fi Channel or is it Stars? One of them's doing a Tremors TV series, and Kevin Bacon's coming back in some capacity to play Valentine in that show. So I'm looking forward to whatever they do in that. But as we stand at the moment, they're still making Tremors films. So, you know, we've had Tremors, Tremors 2, Tremors 3, can't remember what it was called. You know, and we had others. We had Tremors 5. Anyway, in Tremors 5, we had Michael Gross back as Burt Gummer. I think he's been in nearly every Tremors movie. He was definitely the funniest character from the first film and one of the coolest and yeah, he's been back in every movie in that, but we've just had the trailer for Tremors, the sixth film, Tremors, A Cold Day in Hell. So we've got Michael Gross back as Burt Gummer. We've got Jamie Kennedy back. Jamie Kennedy's really starting to look old. Like you used to see the guy like when he was in Scream and even in Son of the Mask, like he's still pretty young, but now he's like, yeah, he's starting to, he's getting up there in age. No one's young forever, unfortunately, but it just looks for like a straight to DVD movie, we've got graboids, we've got ass blasters, and we've got some new sort of spins on the mythology in that as well. Uh, it actually looks pretty good for like a B grade film or C grade. Probably wouldn't even go D grade because from, from what I heard, Tremors 5 was actually pretty good. Not that I've seen it, I've only ever seen the first three. And I think I saw an episode of the, I think it's like the 2000, 2001 TV series, which wasn't very good. But, you know, this actually looks pretty good. Um, I'd be excited to watch this. If this went to a Netflix or something like that, I'd definitely watch it. I might even go out. I know we have Tremors 5 released here. Uh, it's available on Blu-ray in Australia, Blu-ray and DVD. So maybe I'll go pick it up during the week. I might go and see if I can get my hands on it. I think it might even be on Netflix, to be honest. I'll have to have a look at that when I finish the show. I might go out there and have a look and, and watch it and see if it's any good. Yeah, Tremors, A Cold Day in Hell. Uh, looks like a lot of fun. If you're a fan of the Tremors franchise and you've seen all the films in that, comment below. Like, let me know uh, which ones are good and which ones to uh, steer clear of because they all kind of look fun in their own silly, stupid way, as, like, a lot of these movies do. Like, the Sharknado movies. Who would have thought they ever made, like, six of them? I mean, they bring out a new one every year. It's ridiculous. But, yeah... Tremors, A Cold Day in Hell, it's out, I think, the 1st of May in the US on Blu-ray and DVD, so yeah, any US listeners, you're a fan of Tremors, pick that up, tell me if it's any good. And a final bit of news, this one's pretty big because, another superhero heavy episode today, guys, this one's pretty big because we have talked about this before in our DC standalone movies episode, which is actually doing very well on iTunes, I noticed the other day. A lot of people are listening to that on iTunes. It's one of our most listened to episodes, which is very cool. If you listen on iTunes, drop us a review. Tell us what you like, even if you just leave us, you know, a sentence or whatever. Just tell us what you think of the show. Yeah, it'd be nice if to get a few more reviews on there. Honest ones, too. Be honest. It'd be great if you leave five-star one, but hey, tch, honesty. Am I right? So, originally, they were talking about maybe getting Leonardo DiCaprio to play the Joker or some shit like that. Not that he'd ever do it. But, apparently, the word on the grapevine is that Joaquin Phoenix has agreed to play the Joker in this film. Now, from what I've read, he's verbally agreed to do it, but nothing's actually set in stone yet. So, it's just a matter of now of contracts being written up and, you know, signing on the dotted line and whatever. This kind of makes sense because after Marvel couldn't get Benedict Cumberbatch for Doctor Strange to begin with because he was doing a play, the timing didn't work out. Apparently, they still hunted around for another actor to play Stephen Strange. And apparently, another guy who was on the forefront was Joaquin Phoenix. Now, from what I read previously, he was very interested in the role, but he wasn't keen on signing on the dotted line to commit to a multi-picture deal, which is understandable. You know, he's kind of a one-and-done kind of guy. If he was going to come back for sequels, he probably would have done more sequels to any of his movies previously. But in reading this and hearing this, that he's 
at least agreed to do this. You know, this is pretty much a one and done deal. You can come in and you can do your thing for one movie and then leave. You're not really tied down. He really strikes me as a guy who doesn't like to be tied down to anything. He's judging from his film choices and that over the years, he's a guy who likes to jump and change and try different things. And what's more different than playing the clown prince of crime in a 1980s set crime drama thriller that's not really a superhero movie? Like I said to Bob the other day when he sent me this, he's like, have you seen this, Jags? I was like, you know what, Joaquin Phoenix playing the Joker? I'd watch that movie, definitely. I mean, what do you guys think? Joaquin Phoenix is the Joker? There's been a lot of people... Go- when there's casting stuff and that happens, people will like artists and that, they go and do all their artwork things and that, and this is what he'd look like as the Joker, or this is what Nicolaj Costa Waldo would look like as Geralt of Rivia. So people do all these things like Boss Logic. He's he's really um he's really big for that sort of stuff. Like this is what you know Brie Larson would kind of look like as Captain Marvel or all this other stuff. So there's artwork out there that people would have already done of Joaquin as the Joker. And you know what? Just from that artwork, the guy looks the part. He looks pretty good. You know you can see it. He's got that he's got that face and that for it. But I think he would have to he would have to trim down. I I think. I would see his Joker as much uh, thinner, leaner, maybe a little bit more gaunt in the face. I think when he was in The Master, he dropped a lot of weight, and he's just he get, gets that real hollowness in his cheeks. I think that would go a long way to really sort of cementing a Joker performance. So that seems pretty cool. So, yep, Joaquin Phoenix, I'm definitely down for that. Now, like I said at the top of the episode, I've actually watched some stuff this week. I've read some stuff, I've watched some stuff, I've played some stuff. But the one thing that I'm going to talk about today is I've been hanging out for this film and it was finally released on Netflix last Friday gone. It's The Ritual, which is a horror film, inverted commas. We'll get back to that later. It's a horror film based on the book of the same name by Adam Neville, who's actually a very famous English horror author. This is the first I've actually ever really heard of him, like being connected to this film, writing the book that this film is based on. Apparently the guy's pretty popular. Anywho, The Ritual is... Am I going to go spoilers on this, guys? Am I going to go full spoilers? Or will I try to... I'll try to steer away from spoilers to begin with, and then I'll I'll jump into the uh, spoiler-heavy stuff later on. Righto. So, The Ritual is... It's a film about four friends who are hiking in Norway. I think it's northern Norway or northern Sweden. It's one of the two. It says in the opening at the start of the film where they are. They're actually hiking there because one of their friends... At the beginning of the film, they're trying to plan like a lad's trip. They're like, where are we going to go? We're going to go to Ibiza or we're going to go to Tuscany or let's go to Brazil or something like that. They're trying to plan like a lad's holiday where they can go away. And one of the more sensible of the group, he talks about, he's like, oh, let's do a hiking trip. He's like, I want to do this hiking trip. There's this trail in Norway between Norway and Sweden it's called the King's Trail he's like I'd like to do a hiking trip you know he's like I'd like to test myself because all these guys are kind of like in their mid-30s like pushing up to their 40s and that so you know understandable for them to want to go out and you know try and test their limits a bit more before they get that little bit older and it becomes that bit harder so this guy wants to go on this trip that's his suggestion anyway Uh, This friend, he ends up being killed. He's murdered at the start of the film. And then it picks up six months later. And the rest of the boys, sort of in honor of him and what he wanted to do, they've decided to do this trip, this hiking trip, and go on this hiking trail, the King's Trail between Norway and Sweden. And these four guys are doing it. And the, the main character, the person we're mainly sort of focused on, or the film is focused on, is Luke, played by Rafe Spall who's actually becoming one of my favourite character actors lately. I'm seeing him in a lot of great stuff. Like, lately, I've just really sort of... Like, I've seen him in stuff before, and he's been in movies that I've watched, like, years and years ago, but I've really sort of just starting to take notice. Like, all the uh, all his performances are, like, stacking up in my mind, and I'm like, yeah, I actually really like this guy and what he does, like, with characters and his choices in film. You know, he was in the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy... 
He was in Prometheus. He played Milburn in Prometheus. The guy, like, tempts the bloody space cobra and, yeah, gets goes in his throat and that. It's pretty fucked up. Uh, he was in Life of Pi as well, and he was in one of the better episodes of Black Mirror. Better episodes. They're all bloody good. Uh, White Christmas, which was the finale, the Christmas episode of season two. He was in that episode, and he was fucking great in that. Anyway, so he's our main focal point in this movie, Luke, played by Rafe Spall. Now, these guys, they were all, it's established sort of in the first half hour, they really sort of put the emphasis sort of on these four guys. There's a lot of character building in the first half hour, and you actually find out that these four mates, they've known each other since they're in uni. So they were uni mates, and they talk about previous accommodation and that, and they sort of, you know, everyone gets a chance to talk about, you know, their wife and their, my daughters are into this, and it sort of gets established that, you know, they're family men and they have kids, and, you know, to raise those stakes just that little bit more in the film. Anyway, so these guys are on the hiking trip, and they're doing this trail, and they leave a little mural for their friend, you know, he's died with a photo and candles and they, you know, have a drink in his honour and stuff and leave this, like, nice little mural, like, on the top of a mountain, on the top of a hill, like, overlooking, like, all these Norwegian mountains and stuff. It's very nice. And then one of the guys gets injured. He falls and he busts his knee up and he's like, oh, this is my, this is my bad knee. It's, it's pretty messed up now. So... They're hiking around this trail. There's a lodge sort of on the other side of these mountains and they can see it from afar. And they're like, we've got another six hours before we make camp for the night. And then we've got another eight hours before we reach the lodge. And he's like, oh, that's too bloody long. I can't do it on this knee. And they're like, they look at the map and they're like, okay, if we cut straight through this forest, we can get there by nightfall and we can put our feet up. We can have a beer and we can laugh about it all. And this guy, Dominic, who's the guy who actually hurt his leg, he's like, yep, he's just, you know, pissy and he wants to get there ASAP. So they decide to cut through these woods, which, as you imagine, is a bad idea. So they get to these woods. I try not to go too spoiler heavy at the moment, guys. I'll dance around these spoilers, but we'll get to that later on. Anyway... We get to the woods and they make their way in. They find some stuff like hanging in the trees, which is kind of scary. They notice some symbols on trees. Okay, that's a bit weird. And then they find an abandoned cabin because it starts to rain. There's a storm. It slows them down and they have to stay. Well, they have to find somewhere to stay and they come across this abandoned cabin in the woods. We've seen this movie before. So they spend the night in this cabin and then pretty much from there on, stuff really starts to get weird after that. So I'll touch a bit more on just sort of the generalities of this movie and that before I go into heavy spoilers on the film. Now, one thing I really liked about this movie, it, it's, it sits at 94 minutes to begin with, and we've already established that the first half hour, they really sort of spend uh, building up these characters and their friendship, and you get to know them a bit more. You get to know Luke a bit more. Luke's really sort of, he's really hurting on the inside because of the death of his friend. He was, you know, someone involved, and and he's really got like this heavy weight sort of on his shoulders like during this trip. Like, it's to commemorate his friend, but it's also kind of bittersweet and hard for him as well, because his friend was murdered, and he had a chance to act, but he didn't, and, you know, he regrets it, and, you know, his friends say they don't blame him for what happened, but, you know, he still has that weight on his shoulders, like, I should have done something, or whatever. The one thing that I really liked about this movie was, obviously, the setup, but the banter between the four guys. So Luke, Hutch, Phil, and Dom, you really get the sense that these guys have been friends for years, and I actually really relate to these guys because they're a bit older than me in the film, but I sort of relate because I'm sort of around the same age bracket. I sort of feel the same way that they do. They talk about things in the film and that, and I really equate sort of and compare their group of friends to my group group of friends myself and you know pat and bob and our group of friends and that you know they've been friends in this movie since uni and we've all been friends pretty much the same since our college years so in that regard i really relate to these guys in the movie so that just really brought the film a bit closer to me and 
you know, it was easy for me to accept and, you know, it, it just sort of raised those stakes in that. And it just felt more genuine because, you know, I obviously related to these guys a lot more than I would any average normal group of teenagers who are out on a pissy weekend hiking and they cut through the woods. But the banter that these four guys have, it, it feels really genuine. Like, it's really well written. It's very British. And I understand, like, a lot of American audiences and stuff, they find like British humour and sort of dialogue and that very difficult. Uh, we as Australians, you know, the English sort of being our cousins, you know, we find it a bit easier and I do like a lot of British humour and I do watch like a lot of British sitcoms, you know, like we've talked about this before, IT Crowd, Black Books, you know, Little Britain. I've even watched Miranda, as my girlfriend loves that show. It's actually not that bad. It's a bit silly. But, you know, I'm really sort of into that sort of British kind of comedy, the way they talk, you know, the sort of dialogues that they have going. But I just found a lot of it to be really genuine. Like, it was really well written. It just wasn't like, oh, you know, they're just taking the piss out of each other, taking the mickey out of each other. It actually felt like really genuine, like these guys had been friends for years and it really came across in the way they acted with each other. Like in the first half hour, like it's all sort of fun and games, you know, to a point they're all joking with each other and like taking the piss out of each other. But later on when it gets serious, the way they seriously interact with each other, one guy's got the busted knee and Hutch, who's kind of the unofficial sort of leader of the group, he goes, oh, you know, how you going, mate? Better check on you. How's your knee going? How you feeling? You all right, bud? And, you know, talking with the others sort of, oh, such and such is in a bad way, you know, got to get him out of here and all this. All that is just very genuine. And it feels like very real and very relatable because that's, you know, you feel like friends in that situation, that's how they would talk. And that was another sort of comparison point for me. I found that very relatable and I could really, that was just another piece that just pulled me into the film a lot more. Now, the horror in the movie. Technically, this is billed as a horror movie. It's nothing we haven't really seen before. You know, we've sort of got the people lost in the woods kind of thing you know it's very Blair Witch Project in a lot of ways we see some stuff you know they come across this cabin in the woods that they stay in and lots of weird shit happens in the cabin you know it's very evil dead there are other movies in that it kind of relates to you know there's a big like Jaws element where what you don't see is more terrifying you know your mind is running and picturing lots of different things you know that could be out there or what's actually out in the woods you know, and there's a bit of Wicker Man and that in there as well. But all these sort of tropes you've really seen before. Like, it's all been done before. But the thing about this movie is, it's not something that really excels. Like, it doesn't really add too much to all those sort of different tropes and those aspects of this particular genre. But the movie is quite good. I mean, it doesn't really take away from any of that as well, those, like, particular genre staples getting toward the end of the film like the last half hour it does change it up a bit and there's a lot of stuff you didn't expect but i'll get to that in the spoiler section but in the end is it really a horror movie it, it is quite there are a lot of scenes which are kind of the tensions there like you know something's going on in these woods and you suspect and then by the time they find out you know they're sort of are they being hunted what's going on in the woods what's in the woods you know there's some sort of spirit entity demon ghost goblin you know fuck knows we don't know yet because we haven't actually seen anything but you know it kind of a lot of it's not really that terrifying there are moments of not really scariness but there are just like some moments that are quite like terrifying but is it really a horror movie i probably it's probably straddling the the line between horror thriller so it's quite, it's a little bit more thrillerish at times, and then it tips back over to horror, but it kind of like really sort of straddles the line. It's kind of like a seesaw. It kind of like, yeah, and it just sort of straddles the middle. But, you know, at the end of the day, just a pigeonhole, it, it's a horror movie, which is fine. Another great thing about this movie is the cinematography. It's actually really beautiful. When they go into, well, the beginning of the film, when they're on the King's Trail, and you get these wide shots of these guys like walking this trail like off in the distance and you get all of these beautiful like Norwegian hillsides and mountains. Was it actually shot in Norway? I'm not really sure. Probably was. 
But, you know, you get clouds and fog and everything. It just looks really beautiful. And then there's this scene where they're at the top of this hill. And I was like, those poor guys would have actually had to slug their guts to get up to the top of that hill for that shot. But, you know, it's worth it, like, on film because it looks bloody great. But when they get into the woods, the way that it's shot, it really sort of tends to the unending nature of the woods because you see the map... Uh, Hutch, the sort of unofficial leader, he, he's sort of in charge of the map and the compass. And he pulls out the map and he's like, if we cut straight through here, we can save time. We can get back by tonight. You see the woods on the map. They don't look very big, but in comparison to the trail and where they are, they're fucking huge. And like going through the woods is just a bad idea. Stick to the trails. Don't worry about your knee. You would have a better chance of surviving if you stick to the trails. But. You see it on the map, and then you sort of equate that to when they're in the woods. They're, like, going through the woods. They're going up hills. There's all kind of different woody meadows and everything and that. But there are always trees. There's trees everywhere. And the cinematography really sort of lends to, like I said, the sort of unending nature of the woods. Like, they come over this rise, and there's just more woods. Like, just endless, endless trees. And that really adds to the claustrophobia as well, because there's always, like, there'll be a far shot of, you know, just wooded tree area, and you'll see the guys, like, you know, tracking from left to screen to the right, you know, just in and out from behind trees, like, in the, uh, off in the distance in the far ground. And it really adds to that claustrophobia as well. You know, there are scenes where they're in the woods, and it's real rocky and hilly and that, and it, you know, it's real tight and like closed in and you sort of feel that claustrophobia and that emptiness of the woods because it's not really somewhere where people congregate and there's lots of animals or whatever there's birds chirping and that there's none of that the woods are all very silent and very very dead really but yeah all all that stuff is is beautiful and there's this one great shot i believe it was a drone shot when i looked at it it's from high up and it's like looking down into the trees and you see the guys walking in under these trees and then it starts to raise and the camera starts to tilt up and you just start to see middle of the tree the top of the tree go up you see all this foggy like cloud and everything and it's sort of the camera just turns and there's just like unending woods like it just goes on and on and on and it's very good it really adds to the claustrophobia like i said but also the isolation for these guys like these four guys like stuck in the woods there, following their compass they're making their way there but everything that's happening along the way mm, bloody good that's really one of the uh standout features of this film the way it's shot it's beautiful another great moment in the film is how they actually find moments to drop in little snippets of humor to break the tension you know you'll be in a sort of tense scene towards the beginning i think this is about a scene about half hour sort of 40 minutes in they're talking about where they're lost in the woods and we're gonna get out people get rescued down there all the time and whatever and then that scene ends and it comes back you know characters having a smoke and he's like i'm really looking forward to the rescue party and they have a bit of a laugh and that's that's just that little moment before they go back to the serious dialogue it's just that great, you know, two or three seconds that, you know, just that, it just gives you that breath of air, you know, it just breaks the tension. And there are probably two or three moments in the film where they fit those in. Probably one in the beginning, one in the middle, and one at the end. So they're in there. They're nice. There's one at the actual, the bit of humor at the end of the film. That was one of the best. That was more of a physical gag. But yeah, it worked really well and actually got a bit of a chuckle out of me. So yeah, actually worked really well. Nice little bits of humor in there. You'll notice it. All right, let's get into the spoilers. Let's stop mucking around. We'll get into the spoilers. So, these guys are in the woods. When they go into this cabin, so like I said, there's a big storm. It slows them down. They find this abandoned cabin. They go in and they find like an old oven and stuff, an old stove thing, and it's all abandoned. They're going to light a fire. They need stuff to burn. They search this house as an upstairs and they find like this, it's like this effigy that's been made. It's like, it's very wicker man. It's, it's made out of straw and it's kind of like this man with tied together feet. He looks like he has like duck feet, like webbed feet. And he has arms in the air, but he has no hands. He has, like, antlers, 
like deer antlers, like for hands, and it's very odd. And they see like this pagan effigy looking thing, and they're like, "This is bloody witchcraft! This is witchcraft! That's what that is." And one of them says, like, if I hear something coming downstairs during the night, and he's like, oh, get out of it. He's like, don't even say it. And that was another great bit I found, like, very sort of believable because if, like, Pat, Bob, and I were in that situation, one of us would have actually said that, like, cracked that kind of a joke or made that statement. Anyway, during the night, these guys all have nightmares. And because we don't see any of the other guys' nightmares, the other three guys, Hutch, Phil, and Dom, we don't actually see the physical manifestation of their nightmares because Luke is the main character and the guy that the movie's focused on we actually see his nightmare and it actually goes back to where his friend was killed and he was in the shop but he hid he hid behind uh one of the aisles with a bottle of vodka in his hand and he could have went in there and helped him but his mate was like had his skull cracked open and was murdered and he didn't act he just stayed there like he was frozen in fear so we see the physical manifestations of his dreams and everyone wakes up, Luke's outside and you look at his chest and it's like he's been grabbed, like someone's clawed him in the chest, like sunk their claws in to his chest and he has like all these wounds and that and then it turns and it's like something's run away from him like through the trees. You see the trees off in the distance move and all the branches are just like broken. A path has been carved like through... So that's where that Jaws aspect really comes into it because as the film goes on, you know there's something in the woods and you start to actually see little snippets of it. You see like a giant creature just move behind the trees. It's too far away to see or it's too blown up. You can't really make out what it is and it's only for half a second. But it's definitely there and it really lends to that Jaws aspect. Like you don't really see it. You kind of see it. You're sort of piecing it together in your mind what it might be. Anyway, so as we go on during the film, characters start to get offed. Hutch gets killed. The creature, whatever it is, grabs him and hangs him from a tree and splits his guts open and all his stomach and that's fallen out everywhere and it's pretty gross. And then Phil gets killed. Uh, There's actually this really great scene of where you don't have to show the creature. He's in the dark. He's like, I've heard a noise and he's shining the torch and you actually see, like, a, a beastly hand or whatever come out and grab him. But then the speed of it, as it's going away, the camera pans around. And all you see is the torch, like, flailing around. Like, and you hear him screaming and stuff and the monster making noises and whatever. I just thought that was really well done, how they did that. How they show him being carried away, like, very fast and sort of high off the ground. But you don't actually show anything. So you just show that torchlight. That was enough, you know. It's, it makes pictures in your mind. It's very well done. Later on, like, Phil's been killed, and then Dom and Luke are escaping, and they come across a village with, like, lit torches and stuff. They're being chased by this monster, and they find a shack, like, in this village, like a cabin, and they go in, and they get boots to the face, and they get knocked out. They wake up, and they're tied up in the cellar. They're, like, they've been stripped off down to their britches, And then these weird, like, pagan-looking villages and that come in. And this old witch crone comes in and checks them out. They actually find out that Dom, their friend, he's going to be sacrificed to this creature. And once he is, uh, we get our first look at the monster. Luke asks one of the girls in the village, who actually speaks English, he's like, what was that thing? And we actually find out I knew there was going to be some sort of, like, Norse mythology, like, tied into it because they were in Norway. I thought it might have been, like, a fiend or something like that. We actually find out that the creature is... It's described to Luke as... It's a god. It's ancient. It's one of the Jutun. I'm not actually sure what the Jutun is. I was meant to research that, but I didn't. Apologies. But it's described as... It's a bastard god spawn of Loki. The people in the village... They actually worship it. They say it's a privilege to worship this creature. The the claws in the chest that Luke got, it's actually, that was the creature choosing that person. We find out that everyone in the village, they all have the same marks on their chest where they were chosen. So to be chosen is for the honor of worshiping this god. They don't actually name it. They say, we do, we don't speak its name. But the way people are chosen is the creature can actually sense their inner pain. And obviously Luke's in a lot of pain because 
you know, he blames himself for his friend's death and he never acted in that. So that's why he was chosen. But he was chosen to for the privilege of worshipping this god. And what actually happens is these people in the village, they sacrifice like people to this god that come along if they choose not to worship the god. Because that's what the actual the ritual is. The ritual that's named in the book. There's a ritual where Luke will either choose to kneel before the god and worship it and stay in the village because when they're in the village they can't actually leave the god refuses them leave but in exchange for the sacrifice and the worship he grants them like extended lives pretty much immortality they say we live long unnatural lives or life beyond death and all the stuff no pain no death so if he chooses to worship, he'll be granted the same. He'll live in the village and he'll worship this god and be granted immortality, but he'll never be able to leave the forest. So all these people are pretty much... It's kind of like a symbiotic relationship. Like, the god needs them for sacrifices and for worship, but in return, he gives them, you know, life and, you know, they're immortal, but they can't leave. It's kind of like a Stockholm Syndrome kind of thing. I actually found that aspect really interesting about the film. And the creature design is actually pretty cool too because it's like it's like a giant buck. It's like a giant deer, like this black muscly. It's huge too. It's probably like, you know, at the top of its head, it's probably 12, 14 feet tall. It's bloody huge. But its head, the design of its head is actually really interesting because at the top, it kind of has like a buck head with big antlers but then when you see the front of it the front of its face is like the effigy like the human body with no hands and the bottom half of it like going down to the legs is like human arms and hands and at the bottom sort of underneath the legs there's like this muscly it kind of looks like a hood and there are these two yellow eyes that it has it has no mouth no expressions or anything because when Dom's killed, he sees visions of his wife, like, touching his face and that. And it cuts back to her, and she has yellow eyes. But then a frame cuts, and it's actually the creature that has him by the face. And you see kind of like this... It's it's really hard to explain. It's like the bottom of its head. It's got, like, this muscly-looking human hood-looking thing with two yellow eyes. And it grabs him, and it takes him away and hangs him up in the trees. But anyway, in the end... Luke doesn't kneel, he manages to escape and he finds a gun and some bullets and he sets the cabin on fire and the, the creature comes and gets really pissed and he runs off into the woods and it catches him and it tries to make him kneel, it like holds him down, like pushes him down and then it sort of stands up and opens its head and sort of presents itself, it looks like a giant looking totem pole, like almost say like Look at my godliness and worship my magnificence, like standing up looking all radiant and stuff. And in the end, Luke actually gets away. He escapes the forest and he turns back and looks and the creature comes and it can't actually escape the forest. It's bound to the forest, so it can't actually cross the forest boundary. And so it roars and he just like yells in pain back at it. And then in the end, he turns and starts to walk away. And then the film ends. I actually really like this movie because the first fact that it was really well built, like starting, like this movie was nothing you haven't seen before. You've seen all this before. You have. It's been done before. But this movie is bloody good. This movie is solid. I mean, this is a great start to horror for the year. Yeah, it's really well constructed, like uh, it's paced well and the monster reveal is pretty cool and it's quite different and because they're in a different country, they can put that sort of Norse mythological spin on it as well and we can see stuff that we sort of haven't seen before and then at the end where it sort of changes to like a, like a captivity kind of thriller, then you actually see the creature and I thought Luke was going to get killed at the end of the film, to be honest. I thought, like, he's going to die killing the creature or something like that. He'll get the last laugh. But, you know, he, in the end, he did act. He attacked the creature with an axe and he managed to get away. And in the end, he escapes. Whether he lives or not, that's an, another story. Because you actually see in the distance, like, a car on the on a road. It's quite a ways away, but I imagine he got there. But, yeah, on the whole... This movie is quite bloody good. It's fucking solid, man. Like, 
It's not going to set your world on fire, but for what it is, I actually really fucking liked it. And my sister watched it earlier. She messaged me. She saw I was talking about it, and she watched it herself, and she quite enjoyed it as well. So, like I say, it's not going to set your world on fire. It's nothing really that you haven't seen before, but for what it is, it's really fucking well done, and it's a solid little movie. Like, for 94 minutes, there are worse ways you could spend a night. If I was to mark it out of five, let's see, I'd probably give it... Hmm. Probably give it a three and a half out of five. Yeah. But yeah, in the end, it's definitely worth a watch. And if you've read the book, let me know. Like, let me know how different it is compared to the film. I have read that there are some differences. But in reading those, I think for a a film release or a film adaptation, they were probably the right choice to make. But a couple of things... Maybe I would have liked to have seen was the the rest of the guys. Perhaps I would have liked to have seen maybe the manifestations of their nightmares as well. Maybe even just a couple of flashes. We do find out what one of the other guys' dreams was later in the film. He pretty much had a like a premonition of his death. But yeah, I would have liked to have seen that a little bit more. Maybe a little bit more emphasis on the other guys. I know Luke was our way in for the film. And Rafe Spall did a fucking great job in the role. Um, really liked that guy. Uh, definitely keeping an eye out for future performances from him as well. But yeah, from me, The Beard Master, I gave it three and a half bushy beards out of five. The Ritual, now available on Netflix, streaming at the moment. You can get on there and watch it. 94 minutes. If you've got an evening free evening and you want to watch a bloody good little movie fucking get on the ritual and i think that'll do us so if you want to find us online the bearded geeks you can find us on facebook facebook.com forward slash bearded geeks pod we're also on twitter at bearded geeks pod we're on instagram at the bearded geeks if you want to listen to the show jump on youtube jump on itunes jump on soundcloud those three places you can listen to the show two of them you can download and take the show on the go Leave us a review if you'd like. That'd be great. It'd really help us out. Dropping a like on any of the videos and that as well, all the episodes, is a big help. Really goes a bit further to us getting noticed. And remember to share and subscribe. It is much appreciated. From all of us here in the Beard Cave, thank you, and I'll see you next week on the Beard of Geeks. Hey! <laughs>